It's a pleasure to be here with you and a pleasure to be able to uh, talk to you and share some of my thoughts. Uh, I am honored um, to be serving, I'll finish my fourth year as the director of the Department of Insurance and I'm honored to work with Governor Little and um, was honored to work with Governor Otter. Both of them I think very creative, intuitive and courageous leaders uh, who have allowed us to be um, very creative as we've thought about ideas and solutions to our health insurance problems that are facing us today. My goal here today is to share with you some of uh, the direction that the Department of Insurance has been heading and how we see health insurance, uh, certainly the Idaho way. Um, I, I guess I gotta remember I have slides or I'll just, you'll just be looking at the same slide all day. Um, I, I, I had an opportunity to serve uh, for 35 years in the insurance industry. Uh, I've had the opportunity to sit down with families and employers and try and figure out the best solution for them and try and figure out ways that they can have affordable health care costs. Um, I'm certainly not an expert, I'm not an actuary, I'm not uh, a lot of things, but I do have a good understanding of what makes the insurance market work and our solutions have been uh, certainly in some cases vilified, but in other cases are being adopted and, and heralded um, by others across the country. I'm gonna turn this just a little bit. So let me just give you a little bit of the landscape of what's going on within the Department of Insurance. Uh, our insurance market is growing as fast as uh, the state is growing. Uh, we're seeing dramatic uh, changes uh, we had a huge jump in number of licensed agents. We went from just barely over 100,000 to 122,000 um, in almost a span of a year, just a little bit longer than a year. Now most of those mindfully are non-resident licensed, but we still have uh, growth in our number of resident licensed. We've also seen growth in a number of insurance carriers in Idaho, um, obviously not really in the health uh, insurance marketplace we're seeing a stabilization or a, a stagnation, if you will, of health insurance carriers in the marketplace. We are at 19 domestic carriers in Idaho, uh, not all of those doing health insurance, but we also license about 2,200 uh, other entities. Our department had to review over 5,000 new form submissions this last year, and overall as a state, $8 billion was uh, collected in premium. While not entirely the focus of the Department of Insurance, the department spends probably more than any other uh, area on health insurance. Uh, and there's a lot going on today. And I, I do, uh, I, I do want to talk about some of those areas. Uh, I, I want to talk about state-based plans and where we're at with state-based plans. I'll talk briefly about association health plans short-term plans, what we did with the autism bulletin, uh, doing it the Idaho way, and hearing, aid, hearing aids for children the Idaho way. And then we'll talk uh, maybe briefly about uh, 1332 uh, waiver flexibility. Uh, we know that in order to have a stable marketplace, you have to have really three things. You have to have a healthy mix of good risks along with some poor risk. You have to have appropriate competition between carriers, and you have to have appropriate and reasonable contracts with providers. Our goals, the governor's goal and my goal, um, is simple. We want to offer Idahoans more affordable options and affordable products, and at the same time, want to stabilize the marketplace. This next slide is a slide that we like to look at and we've enjoyed over the last several years. I'll show you this one of 2019 and then 2017. Um, this slide is intended to show market stability a little bit. Uh, in 2019 was a better year than previous years. You can, you can see that there's very few areas with dark green. Dark green represents three or more carriers. You can see there's quite a bit of area that's, re that's represented in yellow. Yellow represents only one carrier. If you only have one carrier, 
you're not in a stable market. And I will tell you that this slide is somewhat misleading. It doesn't tell the whole story because in many cases that one carrier is a non-ACA, non-insurance product. And yet it counts. It doesn't count for anywhere except on this slide, but that's, that's okay, that's what they want. You can see when you look at 2017, it was, even, it was even worse in some situations. We had several counties with red. And then if you went back even further, there was even a time when the, almost the entire state of Nevada was in red, and the entire state of Iowa was in red, and Tennessee was in red. And so it, those, those states have at least figured out creative ways to address having insurance in their population, albeit not ACA necessarily, uh, not ACA plans. Um, of course, the objective for Idaho is we want to stay as dark green as possible. We want to keep carriers as possible. The options for doing nothing are poor. If we do nothing, then that will lead to fewer carriers. That will lead to fewer plans. That will lead to fewer choices, more uninsured, higher rates, and the spiral just continues and continues and continues. And I've watched as some of my compatriots at other states have dealt with this problem where carriers were pulling out of the marketplace because they continue uh, to lose money. Um, recently, a recent Gallup study showed that our country's uninsured rate has reached an all-time or at least a four-year high. If you look at that uninsured rate chart, you'll notice the, the number of uninsured since before the ACA and post the ACA has not changed that dramatically. Yes, we went through that, that period where the number of uninsured uh, actually decreased, uh, increased and then decreased, and now it's back to where, where it's at now. American consumers borrowed $88 billion this past year to pay for health care. That's an astronomical number. Interestingly, 11% of those that borrowed that money also had a health insurance plan. 65 million Americans had some sort of health issue but did not seek treatment due to the high cost of health care. And another 15 million Americans, according to the Gallup poll study, showed that they forego prescriptions because of the high cost. Now, we live in the greatest country in the world. However, forcing our citizens to choose between groceries and gas and utilities and health care or health insurance isn't right. 36 countries worldwide make up the um, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and the United States ranks number one in highest health care cost per person. In 2017, we spent $3.5 trillion, that's with a T, in health care in one year. This is roughly one-fifth of our gross domestic product. By 2026, CMS projects we will spend close to $5.7 trillion. The truth is, as a country, we have yet to have the difficult discussion. We have yet to find, be able to talk about what are the true health care cost drivers? This past year, I was asked by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners to chair the health care committee, what's called the B Committee. And rather than uh, do a lot of other things, we decided we'd focus on health care cost drivers. After 24 hours and multiple days of hearings, and mind you, most of the hearings were a few hours at a time, um, Many organizations spent their time uh, defending their own turf or poking, uh, pointing the fingers at others. To make matters worse, our demographics are changing. The average life expectancy in, in 1980 was 74 years of age. Today, it's 79. The average annual expenditure on health care was 3,000 in 1980, and today, it's uh, over $10,000. So 
So how are Idahoans insured? This slide depicts the, the choices are, that consumers have before them and where they're insured. But where I'd like you to focus on is the bottom line. In 2015 to 2016, 70,000 Idahoans dropped coverage. And from 2016 to 2017, another 60,000 dropped coverage. So nearly 150,000 Idahoans are going without what we would consider a recognized form of coverage. And you'll notice that that includes numbers up there for short-term plans. 130,000 at the time when Idaho was the fastest growing state in the nation. That growth should be augmenting or mitigating those numbers. And maybe it is, but we're still, uh, we're still dramatically losing people. We believe most that have dropped coverage are going without coverage. We believe that they're being forced to leave coverage because they don't qualify for a subsidy or they are for one reason or another. Um, we do know that there has been dramatic uptick in those that are partic participating in faith-based plans. That's not reflected in those numbers. This chart shows how uh, Idahoans have been impacted since the initiation of the ACA. We haven't really insured that many more lives. Went from 91,000 to about over 110,000. But Idaho premiums have quadrupled, and Idaho claims have more than quadrupled. We have went from $159 average cost per month per insured to an average cost of $438 per month per insured. And it's actually higher than that once we'll add in 2018 data. So with that backdrop in mind, Governor Otter and now Governor Little issued an executive order on uh, what, we call, what we like to refer to as state-based plans. That order was, um, uh, was issued on January of 2018, and it called for me to issue guidance and to help develop plans that were alternative, affordable healthcare solutions. But the order also called for, which often gets left behind, for us to look for ways of stabilizing the marketplace. The governors and I were concerned and are concerned about the marketplace and what happens if carriers aren't able to afford to still participate in the marketplace. These state-based plans, if you will, um, are what we would call non-compliant ACA plans. And they were designed to incentivize or to encourage the young and the healthy of all ages uh, to return to the insurance marketplace. Our goals were simple. We wanted to provide flexibility to, on our health care policies, offer reasonable and affordable products, and again, stabilize the marketplace. Soon after the executive order was issued, I issued guidance on how carriers could sell state-based plans. These plans followed Idaho state law Idaho State Consumer Protections, and most of the AC rules, but not all of them. Um, it's probably an understatement to say that we took a lot of heat from a lot of national organizations and media and, and some that were very protective of the ACA. Many detractors felt like that this approach would ruin the ACA. Opponents demanded to know how Idaho had the audacity to refuse to enforce our national health care law. Well, as someone wise once said, criticism comes easier than craftsmanship. Many did not understand that the plans we were offering t were tied completely together with the ACA plans, that we required those offering state-based plans to, to also offer an ACA plan, and that uh, consumers would be able to change from their state-based plan to an ACA compliant plan. They further didn't understand that they were tied together from a rating perspective. Rates would be filed under an index rate and that based, at, based on that index rate 
if a carrier came and said they needed a rate adjustment, it would affect the index rate and therefore affect both the ACA plan and the non-ACA state-based plans. Many, frankly, just refuse to understand how ensuring more healthier risks would lower the rates for everyone. They could not see how lowering the rates would attract the young and the healthy. Our main legal argument, frankly, was that the ACA provision says that states have to substantially enforce the law. Words mean something to me, and I think they mean something to most of you. When you say substantially, it does not mean completely. If Congress had meant for us to completely enforce the law, they would have said so. And frankly, most of the time when Congress passes an act that I have to enforce, they don't tell me I have to enforce it. That's implied. So to put in the, put in the law a provision that says I have to substantially enforce the law seems to give us some little wiggle room. What's very interesting about this is that it was under that definition that President Obama and his administration offered the transitional or grandmothered plans in keeping with his promise that you could keep your coverage. They later allowed for the labor unions to keep their mini-med plans under this same provision of law. The Trump administration has allowed both of those types of plans to continue. So we felt like there's the measuring stick. The transitional or grandmother plans or the mini-med plans. As long as we are offering plans better than those, we should be meeting the definition of substantially enforcing. Shortly thereafter, we received a nice little letter from CMS Administrator Seema Verma, who I've had the privilege and opportunity to meet with her several times face-to-face, -face, as well as the SIO Director Randy Pate and many of their staff. And we've had multiple very interesting conversations. Um, conversations with our governors, our congressional staff, and them, as well as uh, others as we've tried to move forward. Unfortunately, too much frustration because we're still not issuing state-based plans. Um, I never in my life felt so much like Charlie Brown who's trying to kick that darn football, um, and Lucy keeps pulling the football out from underneath us. But we are very close, and I anticipate that here within the next weeks, not months, we will issue new guidance. In the letter that we received from CMS, there were eight objections. And I thought I'd go through some of the objections and tell you about where we're at. Uh, of the eight objections now, and then it ended up being a ninth objection not included in the letter, we have resolved all of the objections except one. And frankly, we're very close on that one, and, but may not get there. Here's a few of them. Let's talk about it for just a second. So one of, one of the objections is pre-existing conditions. We wanted to offer these plans year-round. But in order to offer them year-round, you have to be able to avoid adverse selection. And the only way that you can avoid adverse selection is to have some sort of pre-existing condition clause as defined by Idaho law. Idaho law says you can have a pre-existing condition clause so long as you were not on a previous coverage or you weren't coming bare, if you will. Um, so you could have a pre-existing condition clause that looked back six months, didn't, couldn't take into consideration any condition longer than that, and as long as there was no, as long as there was no break in coverage or if there was a continuous coverage, then you could not have a pre-existing condition clause. Health and Human Services understandably objected to the way Idaho interpreted um, the pre-existing condition language, but was willing to compromise to the next open enrollment. You see what most of the media and most that didn't get portrayed in law didn't understand is that even under ACA plans, you have a waiting period until the next open enrollment of January 1st. So HHS agreed to do that. However, after thinking about it and, and consulting with it and realizing the political dynamics of pre-existing conditions, Idaho decided 
that a, to not allow pre-existing conditions and only offer these plans during open enrollment. So I guess I'm sharing with you some of what will be in the new guidance. Ironically, grandmother plans and mini med plans are allowed to have a pre-existing condition clause. Next issue was premium rating. Idaho wanted to go to a one to five age slope. The ACA requires that we be on a three to one age slope for adults, but Idaho was able to show that with a one to five slope, we would actually lower rates on everyone, including those that were concerned that they would have higher rates. HHS agreed with our analysis, um, however, felt like the law was not able to be bent. And even though grandmothered and mini med plans can offer a one to five slope, they would not allow us to offer a one to five slope. The department in Idaho has agreed to acquiesce that point, at least for now. Annual limits. Um, and in our original guidance, we allowed for annual limits to be there at a million dollars per year. But what was also not conveyed in much of the media reports is that at the, when the consumer exhausted their annual limit, they could convert over to an ACA plan. So to the consumer, they wouldn't fill that annual limit um, or that annual limit cap. Again, the ACA, or excuse me, again, HHS was not uh, willing to go there even though grandmothered and mini med plans uh, could have an annual limit. So the department is acquiescing that point. Essential health benefits. Most of you know that under the ACA there are 10 essential health benefits. Of the 10 include pediatric dental and vision, a provision by which the federal government is not enforcing. HHS said to us in their letter and in our conversations that we had to include all of the 10 essential health benefits, even though grandmothered and many men plans do not. The department has acquiesced and our new guidance will have all 10 essential health benefits. The next item was maximum out of pocket. Now this was actually a late, this was not in the initial letter, so if you pulled up the initial letter, you would not see it there. Um, initially, HHS did not object to our language on maximum out-of-pockets. Uh, we were hoping to have separate out-of-pocket maximums for different conditions. For example, you might have an out-of-pocket maximum for medical and an out-of-pocket maximum for uh, prescriptions. Um, however, uh, uh, HHS and SOSIO, CMS have all suggested, even though on May 15th they said it was fine, on June 14th, and June 20, July 22nd, they indicated that we could not. And oh, by the way, yes, grandmothered and mini med plans can have them. Hence, once again, I miss the football. Um, so uh, we have acquiesced that point. Um, the only remaining point is the issue of what we call voluntary health risk assessment and premium credits. The question is whether or not a consumer can voluntarily fill out a health risk assessment and receive a credit or a reduction for the answers on that health risk assessment. HSS and CMS have said, you know what, maybe you can. The, H the ACA allows for health risk assessments to occur on the group plans so maybe it can be done under the individual plans. But they've said, we want you to do it as a demonstration project and we want you to limit your reductions to 30%. We've said, we don't want a demonstration project because that requires approval of not only of CMS and HHS, but also Department of Labor and US Department of Treasury. So we said, no thank you. We want and believe that carriers should be able to offer a premium credit if a consumer voluntarily asks answers health, a health risk assessment. 
the law allows for, the ACA allows for, a reduction if a person stops smoking. There's a non-smoking and a smoking rate. The law also, under the group side, allows for if a person joins a fitness club, loses weight, manages their diabetes or their high blood pressure, has a lower body mass index, but unfortunately, um, HHS is holding to their guns that they would like it to be as a demonstration project. So we may issue the guidance with that distinction or that difference. We think we can show that we have dramatically acquiesced to all but the one issue with HHS and CMS. Now, interestingly, I've talked to you about the differences between the, the transitional plans and the Minimed plans. From the beginning, HHS wanted us to issue our guidance as a short-term plan. And short-term plans have certainly, particularly in the last few weeks, been bandied about and been beat up pretty regularly. And frankly, we resisted going that direction, uh, mostly because our current state law uh, said that these plans were non-renewable and because we considered them to be inferior products to what a state-based plan would be. We also believe that based on our current state structure, that going the short-term route would destabilize the market rather than stabilize it. However, after, um, some, uh, after this year's worth of conversations and a lot of creative thinking, we started deciding, well, maybe we can come up with a better mousetrap. Maybe we can create a different short-term plan than the traditional short-term plans. So most traditional short-term plans are non-guaranteed issue. They are non-renewable. Uh, they cannot even be reissued to the same carrier or another carrier within 63 days. Their total duration by state law is 12 months, although most carriers don't allow them to exist longer than 10 months. They, uh, and uh, while there is no uh, requirement for a carrier to, uh, and there's no requirement for them to also offer a on-exchange product or be part of the same risk pool. These short-term plans, these traditional short-term plans, are offered year-round with limited benefits and fewer consumer protections, um, including pre-existing condition clauses. Most of you know that uh, the administration issued new rules regarding short-term plans. Those rules are under challenge, I will admit to you. Um, but these rules allowed for 364 days of medical insurance coverage to be a limited duration plan. And they allowed for short-term plans, if state law allowed, for them to be renewed up to 36 months. Based on our state law, Idahoans would not have that option, or based on the current law, or previous law, I should say. So this last session, um, Idaho, uh, the Idaho legislature took that issue up uh, at our request, and we created a new uh, provision in law for what we call an enhanced short-term plan. And let me just, I'd probably have to catch up here. So the new enhanced short-term plans um, uh, uh, and, and I, I, I need to say right up front, this, again, offering plans and choices to Idahoans is a high priority of myself and certainly of the governor, and allowing consumers to have good access to good coverage at a reasonable price. We feel that too many Idahoans have been forced out of the marketplace, and too many Idahoans don't qualify for the subsidy in the ACA. We are not abandoning the state-based plans. That's why I spoke of them first, and we are still offering the state-based uh, initiatives here uh, shortly. But we wanted to keep all other options on the table, which would include the enhanced short-term plans. So as mentioned, um, the standards for the, the enhanced short-term plans um, uh, and I'll, I'll do, we'll do some side-by-side -side here in a minute. Um, they, and first of all, the enhanced short-term plans do not eliminate uh, the traditional short-term plans that are intended to help in individuals that are in between jobs. The enhanced short-term plans 
um, the actual bill that passed, House Bill 275, gave the department the ability to promulgate rules and we're in the process of developing those rules. We uh, are anticipating that those rules will be uh, uh, publicized uh, first part of July and we'll go through the hearing process and allow for uh, those rules to, to exist. So um, let me go through some of the differences side by side. Now, I, I'm, I'm telling you what my view of the differences is. Uh, the rules, again, aren't finalized, nor have we gone through the hearing process. But it is our anticipation that under the enhanced short-term plans, they would be guaranteed issue, and they would be guaranteed renewable, whereas under the traditional, they wouldn't. Under the enhanced short-term plans, um, they would be able to be renewed up to 36 months, where under the traditional, they would not. Under the enhanced short-term plans, they would also have to be offered by a carrier who is offering a plan on the exchange, whereas on the traditional plans, they are not. And under the enhanced short-term plans, um, they would be available, they, the carriers could choose either to make them available through open enrollment or could make them available year-round. If they're available through open enrollment, they would not have a pre-existing condition uh, clause. Um, and under, lastly, under enhanced plans, when the bill was drafted, we drafted it in Chapter 52 of the Idaho Code, of, the, of Title 41, which is the insurance code, the, the consumer protection provisions for individual marketplace. Under Chapter 52, that's where all those consumer protections reside, and so the enhanced plans would have to follow those consumer protections. Now, let me shift gears and talk for a minute about association health plans. As most of you know, association health plans were, uh, have been around for years. They, ha they have been longstanding options for small employers to be able to band together under self-employed or individuals. Uh, recently, the administration has passed rules which, have, which would make it easier for plans to exist. Previously, prior to the rules passing, you had to be in the same industry in order to create an association plan. Now, under the new rules, you would be able to band together, such as in a chamber of commerce or some other uh, arrangement. Association health plans offer long-standing um, benefits. However, over the years, we have not seen a dramatic uptick in the number of, of association plans that have been done. Uh, one of the new parts of the regulations is that all of them are regulated as a multiple employer welfare arrangement, and so therefore um, required to follow the Idaho state provisions of law under multiple employer welfare arrangements, with the federal government obviously being able to look through. I think this slide demonstrates the number of association health plans that have been enrolled, not as many as one might think. Perhaps the, perhaps, uh, the rule uh, will be helpful down the road, but time will tell. As many of you know, the U.S. Department of Labor instituted two pathways for qualifying for an, a, for an association health plan. However, a recent court decision in, in D.C. District Court ruled and, and vacated the rule. The Department of Labor, U.S. Department of Labor, is appealing, and until we have the outcome of that appeal, then, then we're still limited with Idaho law and the old rules. Our role at the Department of Insurance is to, insist, to assist employers but at the same time protect the marketplace and keep um, these association health plans from being able to cherry pick from the marketplace. Briefly, 1332 waivers. Most of you know that during the legislature, the legislature finally passed Medicaid expansion. As part of the passage of Medicaid expansion, it called upon the Department of Insurance and the Department of Health and Welfare, and I'm sure Director Jepson tomorrow will talk about it in detail, so I won't but it called upon both bodies to apply for a 1332 waiver. I did think, however, that it 
would be important for you to understand which portions of, uh, of the law are waiverable. Often we get calls from folks that say, well, why don't, you, why don't you apply for a waiver to do X? Why don't you apply for a waiver to do the state-based plans? That's not a waiverable option. So listed on the slide are some of the items that are, are waiverable in the sections that they refer to. Some of you know that in 2015, we had guardrails that were established as to what we could do. It, there was a requirement of comprehensiveness. You couldn't have fewer benefits. Uh, affordability, you couldn't have higher costs or higher cost sharing, couldn't be any worse. And scope, you had to have no fewer than the number of people covered in order to obtain the 1332 waiver. Lastly, and most importantly, you could not increase the federal deficit. You had to show cost neutrality. The administration has loosened somewhat some of the guardrails. Now comprehensiveness um, can be done by offering plans or offering making available the same benefit plans, but not requiring that persons have the same plan. Affordability can be done by having costs and cost sharing arrangements being available and scope can be done uh, with comprehensiveness and affordability of coverage by allowing many to access that. Um, let me go back, sorry. But what remained, the high hurdle and threshold, is the uh, effect on the federal deficit or the budget neutrality. Recently I was in DC and had the opportunity to meet, meet with HHS and CMS um, and Sosio on not only our state-based plans, but also on our waivers that we're proposing. Um, the legislature gave us a pretty tall task. Um, they gave us a task as to how soon to get the waiver approved, because they wanted it available prior to September, and what they wanted in the waiver. And the Department of Insurance and the Department of Health and Welfare are doing our very best to comply with that request. But I want all of you to know that no waiver has ever been approved in the time frame for which the, legis the legislature asked us to approve it. And no waiver has ever been approved to do what we're asking to do. So if we are successful, and I hope we are, uh, we will be the first. Doing health insurance the Idaho way um, is demonstrated this last year for us in a couple of uh, successes that we saw. One of them included the inclusion of autism in our plans. National estimates show that one in 60 children born in the United States are afflicted with autism spectrum disorder, or ASD. And a trove of research showed that early intervention could help autistic children become protective members of society, but also could save thousands of dollars in cost. Until about a year ago, there was no requirement for health carriers to, to cover applied behavior analysis or ABA treatment. After meeting with the carriers, after reviewing, and I have to thank the carriers for being willing to come to the table, after reviewing the Mental Health Parity Act and various other court cases where carriers and other states had been sued, the Department of Insurance issued guidance in a bulletin requiring ABA coverage for autistic children. This slide reflects the day that Governor Little signed the um, Autism Day um, and the day that we issued that guidance. Um, it was a, a moving experience to meet with those families who had autistic children now be able to have coverage. The guidance affects individual plans, group plans, uh, and self-funded plans that are regulated by the Department of Insurance. I can proudly say that Idaho became the first state in the nation to do this in such a broad manner. Um, we demonstrated the savings, and now several states have begun to follow our lead. Thank you. The second issue, the second success we had by doing things the Idaho way, involved the legislature asking us to look into how hearing aids were covered. 
Across the country, the most common sensory uh, defect in the United States is hearing loss. I don't know what I did with my water. Including many children in Idaho. The average cost for he these hearing devices is between three to $5,000. And they needed to be replaced every three to five years. After meeting with the carriers, we found carriers all over the board on them. Most were not covering hearing aids. Some were covering cochlear implants, which were more, a lot more expensive than hearing aids. And some were even being a little more aggressive than that. It's not to be also overlooked that for many of these parents, they have multiple children with hearing loss. With a single household, uh, or multiple children in a single household suffering. During the past year, after numerous meetings with concerned parents and state representatives, insurance carriers, we decided to amend rules 30 and 70, which had previously uh, been a, a prohibition to, to offering hearing aids. Um, we, again, want to thank the carriers for being willing to come to the table. On both of these instances, we found costs to be negligible, if anything, in, order, in offering these benefits. We know that hearing um, uh, is fundamental in a child's development. And key changes with our rules included being able to provide for a hearing device every three years and up to 45 audiologist visits um, after each hearing device. Well, let me just say in wrapping things up, and I'm happy to answer any questions, that there are still many projects that we're working on. Uh, the expansion of the insurance industry has created uh, a number of challenges to the department and the, the market stabilization or market issues are certainly um, top of our list. There are many other issues that we're dealing with such as surprise balance billing and network adequacy. And I won't take the time to go into much detail on both of those, but I would tell you that the Department of Insurance uh, did through a grant contract for a study to develop a tool to measure network adequacy at the inception of the product rather than after a complaint is filed. And also we hope that tool will help us create a benchmark in which could be used in dealing with surprise balance billing. I think everybody agrees, providers, carriers, um, and certainly consumers agree that the consumer ought to be held harmless if they show up at an in-network facility. The dilemma is who should pay for the bill and how much should they pay for? Um, we have had a couple of proposals that haven't met the muster, uh, and we will uh, continue to propose some things, but we hope that our benchmark um, approach may be the latest solution. Again, thank you for the opportunity of meeting with you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be able to visit with the things that are important to me, and I would be happy to answer any questions. I don't know how much time I have, Roger, or if I've spoke. You know, I did serve in the Senate, so I can speak forever, so. We're, we're on time. You're all okay. in good shape. I, we are live streaming to Pocatello, and I've received a text from there asking this question. You may have already addressed it since it was sent. Um, once the state-based plans are approved and available, what do you expect the rollout to look like? Good question. I'm hoping that we will issue the state-based guidance by June 1st and hopefully by the open enrollment period of this next year. And by the way, we hope to also issue uh, the short-term, enhanced short-term plans uh, by July 1st. So that hopefully by open enrollment, consumers would have the choice between uh, all three of those products. Mind you that they would be still in a singular risk pool. The rates would be tied together. Uh, so it is, would be a way to try and attract some of that 130,000 back into the marketplace. Any other questions? Usually Norm has a question for me. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like there's any questions. Well, thank you. Um, uh, as always, there's my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me, to call me. If you have any other questions, we'd be happy to try and help you. Thanks.